Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. Welcome to Captains of Industry. This week in the Cape Town studio with me is a captain of the financial services industry. That's Johan van der Merwe from Sanlam Investments. Johan, welcome to the show. What made a country boy like yourself from Nelspreet decide to go into the cutthroat world of financial services? You know, Lizzie Meyer, my dad was a medical doctor, one of these GPs that had to go out in the evenings to people's houses, etc. And uh, very soon I realized that's not what I wanted to do. And I was always fascinated by business. So, uh, and some of my friends that used to swim with me that were older, they went into and became CAs, etc. And I believe that the business world was uh, the calling for me. Mm. So it was financial services, I investment management that was the, the lure, or was it just generally being in business? No, generally being in business. You mm. know, I only got into investment management really in the later 90s, mm. but I was always in the financial services side. Mm. So you went into what sort of education in order to uh, achieve your goal of getting into the business world? Mm. And at what point did your education start to push you towards fund management? I think it started with me uh, uh, doing a BCom in accounting and I wanted to become a CA. Uh, after that I did a master's in income tax and then I got the opportunity to study at Cambridge and I did uh, a master's in the philosophy of finance there. Mm. And it's really after that that I really got involved uh, on the investment side and the investment market. Actually only when I did my master's in, in tax as well, my dissertation was about the income tax implications of unit trusts. Mm. And I never knew that I would get into the unit trust or the investment game at that point in time, but it's, uh, it's amazing that that you know, struck a chord with me then already. Yeah, so you had this, this background, you had a tax background, you had a sort of an accountancy background, and then suddenly you decided to go into the, you know, the full-blown fund management side of, of, of things. But obviously that's a good grounding. Is that still necessary these days? We'll talk more about how the industry has changed, but is the route that you took, the educational route that you took, still valid today? I think it's a good grounding, but I wouldn't say necessarily. Sometimes people ask me, so for the fund, uh, especially the markets, what would you need behind you? And you know, sometimes I think it's, uh, if I did psychology, it would have been better. Yeah. Um, but I think it gives you a good grounding. Obviously, it gives you a good understanding of uh, financial statements, you know, how to analyze them, etc. And you understand business a bit better. But I, I don't think it's uh, the alpha and the omega of, of investment management, you know, the financial side. They are engineers, you know, they are lawyers, they are in fact medical doctors that operate in this. I think you just need common sense. Yeah. to uh, operate in this industry. You mentioned the, psycho the psychology aspect of things. Um, I've always worked, I worked on a desk in London once and they had a psychologist that would come around mm. and talk to traders, certain traders that uh, were doing badly, certain mm. that were doing well, sort of assessing what their mood was and that sort of thing. Markets are of course, of course based on that sort of uh, philosophy. They are based on uh, human frailties and also confidence and I mm. suppose it's relevant to have someone like that in your team. Now, I think it is, you know, it, uh, I, I think you have to understand the behavior of people, the behavior of markets, you know, markets are really driven by greed and fear and, uh, and sentiment. And if you don't understand those things and you just look at them coldly, you will, uh, uh, you will make some, mm. some mistakes. And I think it's just better to understand it than, uh, than not. Here you are now the top man at Sanam Investments. We'll talk about Sanam Investments later on, but give us your previous uh, positions. Where have you come from? Yeah, obviously during the CA route, I, I did my articles at Deloitte and Touche at the time. Um, and then I got the scholarship to uh, study at Cambridge from Gencor, which is a mining company. Mm. And In the uh, dim and distance past, isn't it? Of course, that's Gen right. Gencor no longer listed on the JSC, but did become something else. They became Bulletin, which mm. is now today BHP Bulletin. And in fact, I worked on the Bulletin deal for Gencor in London. And then after the deal was consummated, I actually joined Bulletin in, in Holland because Bulletin was all the mining assets of the world, that Shell Group. And uh, their head office was in The Hague in Holland. And I, I actually uh, worked there for three years and mm. uh, lived in Holland. So from tax to commodities, and then you started specializing in the resources sector of stock markets or of, of big companies. Yeah, obviously in the commodity side, I was on the finance side. I worked in corporate finance and I did a, quite a bit of tax there as well. But it was more the corporate finance and that at that time, uh, you know, I was headhunted by um, uh, Investec at the time to actually come and head up the commodities um, at Investec Asset Management in Cape Town. Yeah. Did you lean towards resources because South Africa is a resource-based um, 
economy and country. Yeah, yeah, it, it was that. I, I really uh, like the, uh, that side. You know, those people are also the salt of the earth, uh, to go out to the mines and, and see how they operate, you know. They, they make real things. Mm. And uh, I, I always like that. But, uh, you know, obviously it, it, it was uh, resources dwarfed everything else mm. in the country at that point in time. It's maybe not that... Uh, you know, overwhelming at this point in time, but it was at, at that point in time, and that's why I wanted to go into resources. You've got a resources background, so when you look back now, you're obviously still very close to the resources sector. What do you make of what's happening in the mining world in South Africa, the mining industry, with all of the problems we've had over the recent years? Does it make you sad? Yeah, it makes me sad, you know. I think we're not doing ourselves ourselves uh, any favors there it's uh, you know it is something which is very important for our country being a commodity based economy and I think if we look after that industry and uh, then the country would be much better off but we make ourselves very uncompetitive for the rest of the world and we need the investment from our side as well to to really make it tick and and I think we're going to see less and less of it if we carry on and behave the way that we do at this point in time. Do we still have the potential though to resuscitate the industry because as we pre-record this interview the gold shares or well, the gold price are very close to multi-year lows and people are just wholesale dumping our mm. stocks in favour. It's not that they don't want to be in, involved with gold shares for mm. example on just pick mm. gold, the gold sector. Mm. They just don't want to be involved in South African gold shares and yet mm. we've got such potentially great assets. Yeah I think you know um, as, as, as I say, it's, 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 uh, prevention is better than cure. So it would have been nice if we could have prevented it. But now we haven't prevented it. Now we must try and, and solve the issues. I think mm. it's, it's more difficult to, to come back. But I wouldn't put it behind us to really make it at the end of the day. I think if we uh, you know, adopt the right policies, uh, I, I think South Africa can be up there mm. in terms of mining again. I mean, still we are seen as a mining country. Still we are seen as as uh, um, you know, the leaders in that area, and, and I think we must just re-establish mm. that. Mm. And the leaders in the industry itself, I think, are hardy souls. You know, people like Bernard Swanepoel and the new man at uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti. There's so many names. Yes. We always seem to bounce back. We seem to breed them tough over here. Yeah, I know they are, and they're very, very well regarded worldwide. You go to any other country in the world, they know these people, and they they really um, you know value them very highly. Mm. Okay, let's move on from resources now. Where did you go next? Um, after that, I, I was then uh, headhunted by Sunlam to, to join Sunlam Investments. Mm. And uh, yeah, I've been there now 10, 11 years, which has been a, a fantastic journey for me. Mm. And that must have changed enormously over the, over the period you've been there. I want to get into Sunlam Investments after uh, the break. But let's have a look mm. at the, the industry from the first time you went into it uh, to today. It seems to be changing at an exponential rate, whether it be regulations, whether it be costs, whether it be corporate governance. It, it's almost been turned on its head probably since you first entered it. Yeah, Lindsay, it's a very dynamic industry, you know, if you, uh, the, the moment you think that you're getting it right now and you can sit back and say, well, now I know the formula, you know, that's when you have to start worrying. Mm. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's an industry which is changing all the time. You must understand where it's going, how you should actually adapt uh, to, to stay ahead. And, you know, the competition is fierce. It's out there. I think our com competitors are also, you know, very smart people and so on and uh, you know I always say to my people and I've got a very high conviction in people I think this is a people's business and mm. that's what it's about you know that we have to be able to implement and that's the only evergreen competitive advantage what do you mean industry. by implement implement what yeah the way that we that, that we do business mm. basically I mean it's uh, even even though there are huge challenges etc is how do you overcome that uh, you know you can't always rely on the tried and tested. The, you, you have to step out into the unknown. You have to be able to take that, that little bit of risk. And if you're not prepared to do that, you know, uh, you know, you'll get passed by, by many of your competitors. Do you think we're over-regulated? Do you think there are too many layers of administration, too many layers of bureaucracy mm. that have uh, invaded the industry and is, is almost stifling <coughs> entrepreneurship? Lindsay, to a certain extent, I, I want to agree with you. But on the other hand, we probably brought this uh, over ourselves as well. Uh, there's so many uh, scandals out there, things that went wrong. And, and at the end of the day, you know, especially at Sunam Investments, we stand for improving lives of people. Mm. Uh, because a lot of people, they, they don't retire with dignity. And, and, and we have to be successful in that. So with all these scandals, I think those... those uh, um, 
uh, regulations probably are very, very necessary. I must say at Sunum Investments, even though it's, a, um, it's an issue that we have to look at, etc., we don't have to change our DNA of a company because I think we are treating customers fairly in any event. Mm -hmm. That is just in Sunum's DNA. Now, obviously, we have to fill out more forms and we have to show an audit trail that we've done the right thing for the client, etc. But I think, in fact, all this regulation, even though it's affecting the entire industry, from a competitive advantage point of view, I feel that we kind of like better off than many of our competitors. A dozen years ago, or 10, 11 years ago, whatever it was when you first started at Sandlam Investments, uh, what, what, what has become Sandlam Investments, did you have, um, is it a corporate governance team? Did you have a, a whole t room full of people that had to uh, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's as you do now, presumably? Presumably you do now. Yeah, we, we had, we had people but we didn't have teams now yeah. we have teams doing that no it, it's, it's really that uh, because of the regulation because of uh, all the governance and compliance around things you know we we are, you obviously have to appoint people you have to appoint good people in that mm. um, because it's only been 10 years you don't have people with 30 uh, 20 years experience etc mm. in those areas so it is now it is having an effect but it's a level playing field, you know, it's not affecting my business only, it's affecting the whole industry. Yes. But from a competitive standpoint, you know, we're all in the same boat. But it's raising your costs and therefore you have to pass that on to your customers and you're trying to do the best for your customers, as you say. You're trying to alleviate poverty, you're trying to let people retire uh, with some relative wealth. But yeah. with these increasing costs that are being lumped on you, and never mind the small companies, it must be quite onerous for you. It is onerous for us because it's very difficult to pass it on to the customer because it's also a competitive environment out there and I think you just have to become more innovative mm -hmm. and you know look at new things, new ways of doing things, become more efficient here uh, and do things differently there. So mm -hmm. uh, you know all in all it's good, you in just a way, have to adapt. In a way it's quite good for you because uh, these boutiques that used to, w were starting to spring up in for example in the uh, uh, in the 90s, the, the late 90s, 90s mm -hmm. people would say split away from a company like yours, set up their own little boutique but these days they can't do so because they can't achieve critical mass because of the high costs and governance involved in setting up an, an organisation even if even if it's a small one. Yeah it's very difficult you know never underestimate the organisation behind you that's the mm -hmm. first thing. I spoke to a friend of mine the other day who said you know he realised that when he had to go out to CNA and buy a punch and a stapler yeah. you know in a company you just assume many things and if you run your own business it's very different but I think especially as you say on the critical mass side and with all this regulation it becomes even more important you know to have you know some bulk behind mm. you. On the negative side, of course, some of these boutiques that set up are feeders for companies like yours. You'll see a, a, young, uh, a young person mm. who's doing well in a boutique and you'll say, right, let's offer this person a, a great salary and, and come and join us. So maybe it's, again, it's, maybe it's, it's stifling skills. Yeah, I think, you know, as a business, obviously, it's always important, in, in fact, in a people's business like ours, to keep retain uh, your best people there as well mm. and you know if you can't do it if, if a boutique is uh, in the position to be able to attract your people then there may be something wrong in your own space so you mm. have to adapt to that as well mm. but yeah sometimes it's you know horses for courses people are just hardwired in a certain way some people will actually operate better in a boutique mm. and we've seen people leaving our business into boutiques and we still have great friends today mm. but but that's that's a type of environment that suited them uh, very well. We try to create kind of like a boutique type of thing within the large organization, but you know, I'll be the first one to admit that it's not uh, easy to so create a, yeah. a total boutique within a big There's an entrepreneurial spirit is what you say. Hold that yes. thought if you would, Johan. Yes. We're going to take a break now and Welcome back to Captains of Industry this week, a captain of the financial services industry, Johan van der Merwe. He's in the Cape Town studio with me. Before the break, we were talking about the challenges that organisations like yours and smaller organisations uh, face. But let's uh, concentrate on Sandam Investments now. You're one of the big boys. How competitive is it at the top level? Uh, to grab a customer. I mean, how do you get a customer, for example? That's your, that's your lifeblood. Yeah, without customers, we don't have a business, um, you know, and that's what I tell my people all the time. Um, I, I think from the investment side, you know, we do have a challenge. You know, unfortunately, if you walk in the street and you ask someone about Sunlam and you ask them, so what does Sunlam do? They will say it's a life insurer. Yes. But in fact, you know, 80% of the flows of funds into Sunlam are investment related. And uh, we've become much more of an investment business. Yeah, you wrap it in a life policy or an endowment policy or in a unit trust, but the underlying product is really, really investment. 
And, and, and that's why, you know, it's a, it's a real challenge for us to get our brand image out there and the brand positioning, not only as an investment business, but more as an investment business as well. So it is very competitive out there in the market because uh, it's not automatically that people think of Sunlam as investments. Yes, is it automatic still that people think of Sunlam in a, with a certain amount of negative connotations because of the legacy issue? It's perceived yeah. to be a part of the old South Africa. That's right. You know, they think we're the, the grey shoes and the safari suits, but mm. uh, we've, uh, we've moved on a little bit from, uh, from no, there. No, 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 not today. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I think people sit and they, they, they've got a certain perception of Sunlam and I always say I think that the reality inside Sunlam is so much better than the perception outside. You know, some of our competitors get it right the other way around um, and I wish we were there but I take my hats off to them for being able to do that. But, uh, you know, when people really interact with us, you know, where, where that connection is, they're always surprised as to how entrepreneurial we are, as to how open we are at uh, you know taking on new things new ideas and uh, just a general view of being entrepreneurial and and, and we try to um, enhance that and to and to incentivize you know entrepreneurial business within a corporate environment has your PR machine your marketing machine taken a deliberate stance to try and remove the legacy issues that we've just been speaking about and make Sandlams a, a company that uh, is, is no longer thought of in that way yeah, I believe in the next year you will see that there's going to be a different brand positioning of Sunlung where we say that we're not only an insurer, but we're also an investment business and obviously other mm. areas within uh, financial services as well. So much more of a diversified financial services business. And, and I hope that that, uh, you know, it's the right chord out there to, to make it easier for us at least in this perception, yeah. uh, that's there at the moment. There was a brilliant trading update recently from uh, from Sanlam. How much of that did you contribute to? A lot of new business was written, which is not really your uh, part yeah. of the business. You're the investment side of things, yeah. but you must have done well. Yeah, we've, we've done well. You know, I, we've uh, had a senior managers conference the other day, and that's over a 10-year period. We had a compound annual growth rate uh, within our business of just short of 23%. Uh, I mean, you know the, the power of compounding. If you mm. compound 23% for 10 years, you know, it is massive. So I think we've, uh, we've, you know, at least contributed our share. But then on the other hand, I must say that the, the so-called life side of the business, which we now call Sun and Personal Finance, they've done fantastically well as well. Where people said that, you know, life insurance is dead. You know, mm. it's not a business that's going to do, you know, uh, under Johan van Sales guidance and, and the Zay Lambrechts on the... On the um, uh, Sun on personal finance side, I think her and her team has also done a fantastic job in contributing to, to, to Sunlam's rise over the last uh, five to ten years. I was interviewing somebody just after your training update came out actually and they said, well if the consumer is under such pressure in South Africa and the economy is so slow, how are the life assurers and the, their investment wings producing such fantastic numbers? I understand the investment side of things, mm. but where's all the new business coming from? Yeah, I think there is a really emerging uh, middle class out there. If one, if you go and dissect within the Sunlam results as well, mm. where the growth is really coming from is really coming from uh, the previous entry level market mm. where people are moving much more into the uh, um, the middle market. That's the first one. So it's black and customers that is really driving the growth. Yes, in in South Africa, and then obviously Sunlam's got a stated strategy of going into emerging markets because mm. that's where. We believe we've got a competitive advantage and we say we will compete only where we believe we have uh, such a, an advantage. And we've gone into Africa in a big way. Obviously, we're into India as well and in mm. Indonesia now. And, and a huge part of the growth is coming from those areas as well. Mm. Uh, Africa is an, an interesting one because there are certain companies that do it quite well and certain companies, um, there's a food company recently that has had a few problems with its Nigerian uh, venture, uh, for example. How are you doing? I mean, are, are you uh, early? Were you in there early, ahead uh, of the curve? Are you mm. coming in late or is it never too late because it's such a great prospect? I, I, I think it's not never too late, but it's not too late still. I think uh, Africa is still an awakening giant. You know, I think we mm. were one of the first ones in there. But Lindsay, we, we have a very stated strategy as well as to go into these countries with partners. Mm. We say that we've got something to bring to the table in terms of our technical skills, in terms of our processes, in terms of our systems, etc. But we realize that we don't know 
uh, the, the internal workings of the country or the system there, etc. And in I think in 100% of the cases where we went into other countries, we've done it with partners. So the silver bullet in our minds of making it work in these countries is to find the right partner. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to kiss many frogs before you find the princess. And difficult because every single geography, every single country, every single jurisdiction has, seems to have different, uh, different codes, different ethics, different ways of doing things, uh, different handshakes, uh, metaphorical handshakes. So it yeah. must be quite tough. Very, very different. You know, sometimes maybe you can see that West Africa you can kind of like see some similarities, but it's very different to East Africa. Obviously, if you look at North Africa, again, it's much more akin to the Middle East, for instance, than Africa, etc. So you have to look at different things in Sub-Saharan Africa to North Africa and so on. But you know, Salam is in 13 African countries now already, and yeah. we've got actually physical businesses in these countries with partners and it's going very, very well. It's very sad to see South Africa itself falling behind in, in, many, in many ways, uh, economically. Does, uh, are you a little bit worried about the way that the country has let itself slip compared to its African peers? I am because, you know, if, I think if we want to, you know, work ourselves out of our social and economic problems, etc., we need a growth rate of probably north of 5%. Mm. And, and, and we haven't smelled that for a number of years. So, you know, we, we, we need that. And it's a pity. But, you know, we, we're still a large economy in Africa. So, you know, sometimes people will say others come off a lower base. But I, I, I certainly think that we, we should do better. The industry in general, I, I get quite cynical about financial services. My son's 20, my daughter's 16, and they talk. They say, you know, Dad, we'd like to, you know, it's very interesting we, what you're reporting on every day on radio and, and television. Is it a career that I should look at? And I sort of say to myself, I'm not so sure. It's almost as though the financial services industry has just become too big, too overblown, and too self-important. Is that unfair? No, you know, now that you mention that, I, I, a while back I was driving to work and I was thinking that, you know, what is it that we do? It's with all these scandals and the greed mm. in financial services. And I think, you know, some of my friends are doctors and they heal people and others are farmers and they grow crop, etc. And they, you know, mm. they can tell their lighties, this is what they do. What am I going to tell my kids? Mm. And, um, but then I realized, you know, we've got a very, very important job. As I said earlier today, you know, we can assure, we hold, we hold the f uh, financial peace of, pe um, peace of mind of people in our hands. Yes. And uh, we can let people uh, retire with dignity and we can improve people's lives, etc. So, you know, I don't know whether I was just fooling myself, but I think we've got a very, very important job to do. And I think it's, uh, it is something that's going to be there for a while. Mm, okay, well, let's talk about the markets now because we can't possibly let you go without <laughs> finding out when the market is going to uh, move on to, to new highs or, or mm. come back and with uh, tapering in the United States of America, easy money poli uh, policies worldwide. Yeah. What do you make of it all? It's been an extraordinary year. It's almost as though certain of the rules that you grew up with mm. have been thrown out the window. Yeah. But now, now that you asked me to talk about the market, someone else asked me the other day about shares, and I said, but I don't know. They said, but you aren't you in the investment management industry. I said, yeah, but I don't pick shares anymore. I pick people, because mm. I run the business. But I obviously always have a view on the market. You know, When I sit in the investment team, they say, well, we can see that you've been out of this for a while, because uh, you know, of the comments you make. <laughs> but, but I think markets you know, were largely driven this year by, by Fed's peak. And I think particularly the emerging markets you know, were um, you know, affected by that. And at least they made up some of the lost ground uh, in May. But uh, I think the Fed, uh, the quantitative easing, etc., cetera, was, uh, was a real determinant of the markets this year. On the South African side, I think the markets are probably a, probably a little bit racy. Uh, only very recently, for the first time in probably four years as a house, we've gone underweight equities course, we just believe that the markets have, have run quite hard. But overseas, we're still very positive about the markets. Mm -hmm. But yeah, very different things, you know, affecting the markets all the time. But being a value house and, and, and really following that value philosophy, we keep that grounded by that anchor. And, you know, we try not to be swayed too much by fads and fashion, etc. But try to look at the intrinsic value um, of the markets. Mm. Right, so you're not in the markets anymore, and you get um, you get uh, 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 comments from your team about the fact that you're not because of the comments that you make. Yeah. Uh, what do you do to relax? Now you're picking people. Yeah. You're in charge of a giant organisation. What do you do to relax? 
I, uh, I'm quite a keen swimmer, so mm. that's my main sport. Um, so I'm, I, I try to be competitive in my age group. Mm. I'm always worried if I say Oh, you compete, do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I compete. I've been to the last three world champs mm. uh, for the, in the masters category. Mm. I always uh, have to you know, qualify that. I think people, uh, I'm worried they think I, I swim against Rake Nietling and, and Roland Schumann and, and Chad Leclerc, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I swim against my, <laughs> my age group out there. Yeah. And, and, and I find that, you know, I like the competition. It's fantastic. In my days when I used to be a swimmer, we couldn't compete internationally. So to be there now and stand next uh, uh, to Olympic, uh, former Olympic champion on the blocks, even though he's also 48 years old or so,